Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the first episode of Scientist Talks. And who better to start that with with the founder of our institute? Hopefully, by the end of this, we will get to know what it feels like to walk a mile in the shoes of someone the entire country looks up to. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. So, we would like to know what a typical day looks like for Professor Majumdar. A typical day? Okay, so I uh, normally wake up around between 5.30 and quarter till 6, around 5.30. Uh, the usual chores, then I go, when we have a two-floor house, I go down, have some cats, have to feed the cats, so that's what I do in the first thing in the morning and uh, essentially then come back and work for about an hour, hour and a half doing emails, attending to uh, some unfinished tasks, etc. mostly academic, and then get ready to come to the institute. After coming to the institute, you know what I do. <laughs> yeah, the usual things, teaching, research, gossip, not much of gossip, and then go back home and again, back with my laptop, uh, do the usual chores, maybe after dinner, have dinner around 9.30, after dinner, watch a little bit of TV, and then go to bed around maybe 12, 12.30. That's, that's what a typical day looks like. How do you organize, plan, and prioritize your work? Uh, I usually uh, plan quite meticulously, uh, most of the time, I am sort of behind the basic kinds of tasks that I need to do, behind schedule, so to say. Uh, so I, I, uh, my planning is driven by deadlines that I need to meet with respect to uh, different kinds of chores that I do, writing papers, uh, discussing with students on various projects, writing grant proposals. So most of the planning is based on deadlines that I need to meet. So that's what it is. Okay, sir. Uh, we have known that over the years, like uh, you were quite successful in developing and also maintaining effective working relations with uh, other scientists say, and research groups and also funding agencies and also the public. So we want to know what is your secret behind all of this? Oh my God, you asked me too many things. I'm not very sure that I'm actually successful in all of this. Um, but anyway, I do have a fairly cordial relationship with my colleagues. I have a very nice relationship with most of my students, uh, whether they are PhD students or students who are currently taking my courses. I may not know their names uh, by heart, but uh, generally I have a uh, fairly good relation with them. Um, the, there's no secret to all of this. You just have to respect others and you have to be mindful of uh, the kind of dealings that you have with them. Uh, the most important part is to be able to respect uh, other people, whether they're junior, whether they're senior, you have to respect, you have to have your ears open to them. You have to be mindful of the fact that they have their own attitudes and you can't, can't get angry. Uh, so as long as you're mindful, as long as you're respectful, I think uh, like the, um, but still you have to, have to focus, you can't uh, go astray. That's essentially what it is. I mean, it's not a big deal. It's not a big thing to do. Uh, yeah, that, that, that's all I can say. Um, you have been a part of a lot of academic institutions because so educated. Uh, what so have I done? <laughs> you've been a part of a lot of academic institutions yes, today. Yes, so yes. why did you choose those institutions and how much of that was actually planned? Or have you ever allowed yourself to go with the flow like most of us do? No, I don't go with the flow at all. I have a vision, I foresee what's coming, and uh, that's what drives my academic life. So I can um, tell you a little bit of history, not all of it, which you will know. Um, I think this is useful for you to know this kind of history. I've been doing, well, as you know, that I uh, grew up with statistics and uh, slowly over a period of time moved over to human genetics. And the reason why I moved over to human genetics is human genetics was the is the uh, more quantitative aspect of biology, and so you know, my heart, even though I was good in mathematics and statistics, my heart.
thought was in biology, so over a period of time I drifted to that particular area of biology where there is a lot of quantification, use of statistical methods and so on. Um, and the Indian Statistical Institute actually played a big role. Uh, Indian Statistical Institute essentially, uh, incidentally is my alma mater. That's where I've done my bachelor's, master's and PhD. Uh, so Indian Statistical Institute has played a big role in development of human genetics in India. And uh, so over a period of time at the Indian Statistical Institute, things moved into quantitative biology, but never actually moved into human genetics per se. We didn't actually have a separate department of human genetics. And uh, I foresaw that human genetics is a lot, has a lot of future and uh, has a lot of um, uh, will have a lot of presence in the domain of science. So uh, again, with, uh, with, with support from some of my colleagues at the Indian Statistical Institute, I uh, formed the first human genetics department there. Uh, almost simultaneously, there was a lot of, uh, at that time when we were growing up and you know, developing our own careers, there was a lot of talk about um, private-public partnerships. Uh, you needed to be, uh, needed to engage with private partners, not just for the money, but also to understand, uh, you know, what uh, these, these people who are, usually have a commercial bent of mind and where uh, science and commerce meet. So we, need, we needed to train ourselves. Uh, so there, there's this uh, person by name, an investor by name, Unil uh, Chatterjee in Calcutta. Uh, well, he lives in New York, but has a lot of uh, presence in Calcutta, not just Calcutta, uh, various uh, cities in India, he actually uh, owns a fair share of the Haldia petrochemicals here. So he uh, you know, decided that he would invest in education and research. This was uh, around, uh, around 2000 or so. Um, so we, uh, he got in touch and we initiated what's called the Center for Population Genomics. And it was uh, very interesting that uh, we were able to obtain the largest single grant from the U.S. National Institutes of Health that ever came to India, uh, several million dollars. It was $19 million grant in 2000. And uh, so that, that, was, uh, that was a huge grant that came and we worked on that grant for about 10 years. Uh, and after that, the government decided that they will make some focused institutes and I got a call from the secretary one morning, did I have any ideas? It was too early in the morning for me to have any ideas. So I told them that you know, by the end of the day I'll come up with some things and, uh, and, and discuss with them. He said, uh, you don't, don't call me, write me a paragraph, which is, which is what I did. And from that paragraph he ended up making a 210 page document. One of these days you should go and see that document, it's in the director's office. Uh, that, that was the development of this institute, uh, that was in 2009. Uh, as you may or may not know this, that you can have an idea, but for government to invest in that idea, especially if the idea is uh, large, you have to have, uh, the government will organize various types of uh, discussion sessions um, here within India with different kinds of groups some scientific, some uh, you know, uh, administrative, some financial and so on. So all this went on for about six months. The secretary and I, we also went to the US and uh, they had, uh, you know, put together a, an expert group of scientists in the US. So anyway, to cut a long story short, after all of that discussions, uh, everybody gave a green signal to the idea that uh, a center or an institution of biomedical genomics and in uh, 2009, uh, the parliament actually uh, approved of the formation of this, uh, uh, this institute. That was also an experience when I had to go to the finance ministry and you know, the finance minister, the finance secretary, never ever had been to the parliament, but uh, that was the only time that I had been to the parliament to defend that such an institute should be formed. Um, and that was approved that day. That was in 2009, and uh, yeah, so uh, there was a press release by the parliament, and so we were all very happy. I was still working at the Indian Statistical Institute, um, so but but started coming to Kalyani, looking for land, looking for 
Uh, I didn't actually want to wait for a long period of time when the campus would be developed even if we got the land. So I was simultaneously looking for land and a building close by where we could start operations from. So we were lucky on both counts in this uh, you know, town of Kalyani. We got this plot of land, the 30 acre plot of land, and we got uh, a large floor on the, on, the, on the floor of a hospital where we started operations in 2010. Um, and that, that so, and that, then the campus was built and all of you came to the campus. Um, the students were the first to move into the campus as a matter of fact. Even before the faculty members moved in because the hostel was ready. And uh, so, you know, we are very grateful to the students, uh, your predecessors, so to say, in the institute. They actually started this campus, uh, started the ball rolling. And now we are in the campus and that, that's become another institute. So, we were, where we stayed for the first six years, uh, maybe seven years. That, uh, so, we moved to this building. So, that's the history of this institute. Thank you, sir. Um, what is your take on how academic field has evolved over years? Uh, academic field meaning which academic field? Human genetics or general science? General science. Oh, I'm not so knowledgeable. I don't know about general science. General science has moved in very, very specific domains and there have been, you know, general science covers a very broad range of uh, a more uh, focused domain, more specific domains. There are certain domains that have flourished during certain periods of time. At other, other periods of time, um, some other domains have flourished. From about, I would say, from about the mid 1990s, because of uh, major advances both in both in conceptualization and also in technologies, in terms of technologies, development of technologies, uh, genome sciences has uh, actually flourished. And as all of you know, that the Human Genome Project was done. The HapMap project was done, the International Cancer Genome Project of which we were a part was done. Uh, so these were these are main big projects that were done that identified the nature and extent of variation across individuals in various countries and the nature of extent of variation um, in uh, well, establishing that cancer is a disease of the genome. Um, and cataloging and identifying functions of those variants that cause cancer. That was, I think, the, the, the entire period from about the mid-1990s even till now has been, um, has belonged to biology, has belonged to human genetics. Simultaneously, we, we had other domains also uh, developed. We had uh, accelerators, for example, atom smashers, accelerators, and big, big time underground and, and so on and so forth, but those are domains that I do not understand very well. There have been major strides in uh, mathematical sciences and computer sciences. Um, the whole field of um, artificial intelligence and machine learning, which was nascent when we were students, have now is now a complete field by itself. Uh, they are also invading, uh, invading not in the, in the wrong sense of the uh, of usage, they are also invading uh, biological sciences and helping us derive uh, more meaningful, uh, more meaningful inferences from this kind of data. So these are fields that have grown. I'm sure that I've missed many. I don't understand chemistry. I'm pretty sure that there have been major strides in chemistry as well. But from about the mid 1990s till now, and the 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 you know the impetus um, is continuing and will continue to be with human genetics and genetics in general for some of time to come. Yeah. Okay, sir. Uh, according to you, what are the strengths and weaknesses of young researchers and what is the most challenging part of supervising them? Uh, well, I think the strength is that they are much more uh, informed uh, than what I was at your age, for sure. Uh, this has been facilitated by various kinds of things. Um, the ability to access uh, information and knowledge uh, through you know, electronic means and so on. Um, this, has, this, is, this is the major strength. Your breadth of knowledge and information is far superior to what you know, I was, I had at your age. So that I would say is a major strength. 
the weakness is that uh, uh, don't know if it's a major weakness in all, but in many that I see, the depth of math knowledge is missing. The breadth of knowledge is very high. The breadth of information is very high, but uh, because you are uh, you are actually not reading textbooks, but only gleaning information from various data, other kinds of data sources. In spite of the breadth, uh, the depth is missing, and uh, oftentimes missing. I wouldn't say missing at all. Uh, I wish that you know you are developed. Uh, you meaning not you in particular, but uh, referring to uh, your generation. You developed uh, you know, certain kinds of focus interest, and there you really went into depth, and uh, that would be very helpful. Uh, many of you actually, I see that uh, don't have that kind of depth. Even if it's a part of your coursework, even if it's a part of uh, your domain of um, domain where you should be interested, the depth of knowledge is missing. But again, I, I really think that you can put together uh, multiple uh, domains of knowledge, multiple kinds of information together uh, because you have access to that knowledge and because you have empowered yourself with that kind of knowledge. Uh, you are more multidisciplinary, uh, at least in thought, than we were at your age, so I would consider that to be a great strength. Uh, coupled with this, if you develop uh, uh, you know, depth of knowledge in certain uh, focused areas, I think it would really help you steer forward uh, very rapidly. And what is the most challenging part of supervising all of us? Uh, the most challenging, well, as you know, that I have not had too many students here because of the kind of work that I have to do or had to do. I was uh, doing brick and mortar as opposed to test tubes and petri dishes uh, when I joined this institute and started uh, making it. So I did not have too many students uh, in this institute. I actually never had uh, simultaneously many students because my uh, you know, brain is very small and I can't supervise simultaneously very many people. Uh, I've never had uh, more than three uh, PhD students at any single point of time. Um, but in this institute, I probably have had more than one student at any point of time. Um, to me, I, uh, my relationship with all my students have been um, fantastic. I would say I've learned a lot from my students. So I really haven't had major challenges uh, with respect to uh, many students. Some students, of course, for a period of time, you know, Will fall in love with somebody else and not come to the institute and go away. Those kinds of things happen, but uh, have happened. I've seen that happen myself. Uh, but you know, those are, those are sporadic, those are transient. Uh, but again, I, mean, I think that's, that's all natural. So I, I really honestly haven't faced any big challenges. I wish some of my students had a little more quantitative bent of mind because I'm not a a uh, lab oriented person per se, but always I've had uh, my students work in the lab under supervision of uh, some of my colleagues, uh, and I mostly did the quantitative part of it. Uh, some of my students were not uh, not quantitative enough in their thinking, did not have the uh, quantitative uh, arsenal, so to say, to be able to analyze their own data. So that's been a challenge, but that's also been a part of my own learning how to teach people who. Uh, are not empowered with certain kinds of uh, you know, abilities. So that's, that's, that's nice. Uh, it's overall very nice, actually. A large part of the research which you focus on, and that is on evolution and the diversity of the human race. So, in a country like India with such diverse ethnicities and religious backgrounds, have you observed any change in the public reception to your research? Um, very good question. Very Thoughtful question. I uh, I think overall there has been uh, first of all an appreciation of the diversity uh, that is embodied in uh, the humankind in India. Uh, I think that that has sunk in very well that there is a lot of diversity, uh, and uh, this diversity is not all indigenous. Uh, some of it have come from uh, mixing of peoples from outside of. India as well, and as you know, the poet Rabindranath actually uh, embodied this in one of his uh, famous poems. Uh, so I think you know, uh, 
those kinds of things uh, have sunk in very well. The problem is with the interpretation of uh, of this diversity. Um, there have been, uh, you know, uh, right now we are passing through a bad phase in the sense that the uh, diversity is being misinterpreted, and uh, so I think there have been, you know, times when people. Uh, identified themselves well with diversity and at times when people felt that uh, this diversity uh, has certain underpinnings which uh, which does not treat all uh, the entire gamut of diversity as equals. So there is a lot of inequity in visualization of diversity uh, which should not be there, which uh, everybody should respect right diversity. But, uh, we are passing right now through a phase when uh, diversity is not necessarily being respected in an equitable manner. Uh, and so uh, I think that's, a, that's a, a failure on our part and many of us are actually uh, working towards uh, you know, removing those kinds of misgivings. Um, but again, I, mean, I think that's a very thoughtful question. I uh, don't see major changes that have happened, the uh, changes, uh, the wrong kinds of changes are coming back and uh, I really don't know how to handle the situation very well. Um, I can even tell you that right now, uh, as of uh, day before yesterday, there is a news that's broken which is that uh, one, of the, one of India's famous archaeologists is now attempting to do, uh, attempting to analyze genomes of uh, people of India in order to establish racial purity. And this, I think, is is a horrible thing to see happen. Um, and first of all, I think race is something that we have decided, uh, the world has decided to discount or to, to dispel with. And purity is not even ever defined. And you know, all of the bad times that have read back times that we have read uh, that involved dictators were all on the were all uh, founded on this concept of racial purity, and that such a phrase is being used now in India um, is something that I just uh, feel very depressed about. That. As a matter of fact, I've been writing emails in the last couple of days, very dejected and very depressed that you know even. Scientists should start thinking about racial purity now. Uh, that's very depressing. So, uh, given this, I don't know, uh, uh, you know, how our own work has panned out. But we hope that this is only a passing phase, and it's not, uh, it's not going to uh, stay for long. If you could change one aspect of your life, what would it be? Oh. I don't know, you have to tell me that. <laughs> How do I know which aspect of my life I need to change? I don't know. I really don't know. Honestly, I don't have an answer to this question. So, like some regrets. Like some regrets or something that you would want to not have it? Not really. I don't really have any regrets. Uh, no, I think I've lived a very happy life and productive life. Uh, no, I have. Then actually this question is also kind of like that. Okay, but I'll still ask it. If you had to switch professions with someone, who would it be and why? If I had to switch professions with someone, I probably would switch to a medical profession. Okay. Uh, the reason being that, you know, it's very useful to help other people. And uh, I always find that uh, many doctors, not all, Many doctors are very passionate, very careful um, about their patients and I really find that uh, to be extremely uh, heartening and uh, I, I wish that I could also uh, serve humanity in that way for at least for a period of time. I don't know whether, since I've not been in the medical profession, uh, I'm only looking at it from a distance. Uh, you know, sometimes you look at something from a distance and you believe that that's what you should be doing. And once you start doing that, then you get bored. So uh, I, if you ask me honestly, I like that profession, but I don't think I can endure it for long. 
because there's a lot of mechanical, it's, it's kind of, you do the same thing over and over again and that's something that I really don't enjoy. So I enjoy science primarily because every day is a new challenge, you're meeting with uh, you know, new kinds of problems, trying to think about how to solve those problems, etc. So that's, that's very interesting uh, as opposed to doing the same thing over and over again. Um, we're going to shift a bit of and this is something which might be a bit um, dicey, but you all of us want to know how is your walk with God? How do I work with God? How is your walk with God? What's God? Can you define that for me? If you can define it for me, I will uh, tell you how I can walk. Uh, so the perception is that what we find in our temples, mosques, churches, someone who is supposedly up there and going to help us through all phases of our life we have. So. Uh, I wouldn't say I'm disrespectful, but I'm kind of not interested even though. So. Uh, you know, I live in a neighborhood and the neighborhood has Durga Puja and all that. For years I've been the president of the Durga Puja committee, but do I believe in the rituals? I don't. I, I think that you know, Durga Puja is wonderful because it brings people together uh, and we sit there for these uh, three or five days and chat and eat together and so I, I like the uh, social it's aspect of yeah social aspect of that uh, but I'm not really able to do it which was honestly so what do you do when like you are dejected and you have to what do I do when I uh, when I'm dejected well, I don't know I've been dejected in the last couple of days for the reason that I just told you I've been writing emails to friends and we are, you know, I, I guess, yeah, sometimes, uh, sometimes I just keep to myself, uh, essentially, and more often I exchange, uh, talk to people and exchange views regarding the reason why I'm dejected. Uh, right now I'm dejected about this racial purity, uh, horrible thing that's happening. Um, but again, I mean, uh, God is something that I don't fall back on. Yeah, so even when I'm rejected, so I, 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 I like the uh, people coming together in a temple, but it's a part that I like. Many of them will actually go and prostrate themselves in front of whatever deity there is. I'm not really one of those. So, so if uh, you had to choose a character from a, from any book, comic, or a movie, which one? Dennis the Menace. Dennis the Menace. And why? My favorite. Or die. <laughs> and why? And what? Oh, and why? Oh, uh, well, why? I can't tell you. I just like his temperament. I like his the way that he, you know, deals with people. The way that he deals with his neighbor. That's very interesting. So overall, I think you know, he's a character. But whether I would like to be Dennis the Menace, I don't know that really. But I like him. Um, the final question, like, what do you envision for NIBMG in the future? Oh, what do I envision? I uh, envision that all of you will uh, get jobs in the institute <laughs> and uh, take, steer the institute forward. The institute will become like, you know, one of the big names in institutes, uh, certainly in India and probably in the world. That's what would make me very, very happy, uh, both in research and in making an impact on society because after all, Biomedical genomics is uh, something that needs to be translated to society. It's not like an esoteric something. It's not theoretical physics that you're solving, uh, you know, things that you... It's a it's very practical subject. So as long as you're able to do research that will bring some solace to uh, humanity, solace to people who are suffering, uh, that would be just absolutely fantastic. Yeah, I would like to see that, uh, the Institute of Prospering. All of you are you know, actively working in the field of field of biomedical genomics and contributing. Sir, uh, thank you. Uh, it was a wonderful experience interviewing you, and we have, I'm sure, gathered a lot of insights. And I hope whoever sees this interview also feels the same. And uh, thank you so much for your value. Thank you. Thank you for organizing all of this.